Hey guys, I want to do a video and discuss eternal security in Christ and look at this from a perspective of a marriage. And so I want to preface this by looking at a few verses where it discusses twain becoming one flesh or two becoming one. And this first mention is in Genesis 2.24 where it says, Therefore shall, shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Jesus quotes this in the New Testament in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, when speaking to the scribes and Pharisees about marriage and divorce. And I'll read from Mark 10, verse 2, And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said to them, For the hardness of your hearts he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And in Matthew, he expounds on this in Matthew 15, 8, I'll read, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So Jesus is speaking to them from a carnal standpoint because that's all the scribes and Pharisees can see. They have no spiritual discernment. Um, they're looking at the flesh. They're looking at the law. They're asking these questions, tempting him. But Jesus is also beginning to reveal spiritual truths that although in the Mosaic Law there was a bill of divorcement, it was because of the hardness of the heart. And from a spiritual sense, God doesn't see divorce. He doesn't see breaking of covenants or agreements. And it goes on to say, from the beginning it was not so. Um, so this was not okay um, in God's eyes, but it was done in... Um, you know, in at that time, uh, man is constantly broken agreements and covenants um, with each other and with God. Um, God's everlasting covenant with mankind. He had to step in in the person of Jesus Christ to fulfill both parts of the covenant to keep our part because we broke it, um, and to keep His part, which He obviously. Uh, did and kept both parts and that's why it's still an everlasting covenant um, but looking at this a little more from a spiritual standpoint uh, the apostle paul was given a lot of revelations uh, of the mysteries of god and he uses this same phrase that we've read previously uh, beginning at genesis 2 24 and ephesians 5 and i'll read verses 28 through 32 where it says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So here we see this union of two becoming one the church being in union with christ and becoming members of the body of christ through faith and paul was speaking to believers at the church of ephesus and revealing these um, spiritual truths to them and you know, so it can be looked at as our body being spirit, soul, and body, you know, or our being rather, um, being soul, spirit, and body. And our spirit is married to our body, our flesh, you know, our carnal flesh and our spirit. They're in union together. And our body and spirit are under the knowledge of sin, under the law. We have a conscience. Uh, we know right from wrong, but yet have transgressed 
God's laws and committed sin in our flesh. And all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. So we have a problem here because the wages of sin is death. And so this union of our spirit with our carnal flesh, our body's going to die. But if this union continues and our spirit hasn't divorced and remarried or found a way to get out of this covenant with our carnal flesh, then it will also perish. It will suffer the second death. Um, so how do we as human beings get out of this dilemma? Um, well, let's look at this a little further in Romans 7, and I'll read the first four verses of the chapter. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So God is always being a loving heavenly father and providing for us at all times has given us a way to not experience that second death but to receive eternal life and just to finish romans six twenty three, for the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord so he gave us the person of jesus christ God manifests in the flesh to come down and lead a sinless life and die for our sins and overcome death for us through his resurrection. That is how we are able to marry another, our spirit marry another. Because when he died, it's as if our flesh died. He died for us in the flesh so that we could live in the spirit with him. So now we are no longer under the law. He fulfilled the law for us, something that we couldn't do. So by us looking at the law, understanding our flaws, our blemishes, that we have transgressed God's laws and that we can't uphold it, we use it properly as a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ who did fulfill it perfectly. We understand that we're a sinner. We acknowledge our sins and that we need a savior and turn to him in faith to receive the gift of eternal life. And that is the way our spirit is able to marry another. It's not a divorce. Our spirit is a widower. If it was a divorce, then it wouldn't, it would be nullified because there is nothing that can be broken asunder in God's eyes from a spiritual standpoint when it comes to a union or a covenant, when two become one. So the only way that we could overcome death, where this union between our spirit and our flesh could be nullified, is what Jesus Christ did for us. He died in the flesh. And it says, if we were on that cross, our flesh was on the cross, being crucified with him. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he was made for our sins, 
sacrificed himself for our sins and overcame death, the penalty of those sins, death, for us. And we, through faith, receive his righteousness, his perfect holiness. Uh, we are justified, we are sanctified by our faith in him. In 1 Peter 2.24, it reads, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. That's eternal life that we're living in Jesus' righteousness that he imputes on our account. It's by his stripes we are healed. Um, in Hebrews, it says in Hebrews 9.15, And for this cause he is the mediator of a new testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a test testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. The Old Testament were the perfect attributes and holiness and righteousness of God. It revealed who God was and showed us that we weren't God, that we're imperfect, that we're mortal humans and couldn't uphold the law. Therefore, Jesus upheld the law and then died for our sins so that we could have everlasting life through him. The testator died and when the testator died jesus christ on the cross it's as if our mortal body died and we see that in galatians 2 verses 19 through 21 for i through the law am dead to the law that i might live unto god i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So we're dead to the law once we place our faith in Jesus Christ. We've used the law properly and it's led us as a schoolmaster to Christ. We're no longer looking at the law. The law's never had any life in it. And... Once you realize this, understand this, then you are allowed to use it properly. You've humbled your heart, realized you couldn't uphold it, that you're a sinner, and then put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've had that repentant heart, that change of mind, that change of heart, of trusting in yourself or trusting in something else, um, dead works, um, unbelief and turn into faith toward God in the person of Jesus Christ, what he did for us. Um, you know, and this is that point in time that I always talk about of that moment in time of faith, uh, acknowledging the truth of Jesus Christ, this eternal truth um, that he died for our sins and overcame death for us and that it's a free gift and it's nothing that we do. It's what he did and we receive it through faith that at that time we have that repentant heart. We, it's repentance unto salvation. And at the same time, there's a spiritual baptism that occurs, a baptism into the body of Christ. And that's what it's talking about. Um, when it's talking about the, the spiritual congregation of believers, the church becoming the members of Christ. We are in Christ and he also indwells in us at that moment of faith. Um, we receive the Holy Spirit of promise. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for instance, it says, for as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ for by one spirit, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit? So in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, this baptism is a spiritual baptism of believers into one body. The many members, um, all believers from the creation until the day of the Lord 
will be part of that spiritual congregation, that church that becomes part of the body of Christ. Um, that's what Paul is relating in Ephesians 5. And again, we receive this gift through our faith. In Ephesians 1.10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And goes on in verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ and whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. So it's to the praise of his glory, not our glory. We're not doing anything to merit eternal life. We're not doing anything to keep eternal life. The power of God keeps us. It's this bond, this spiritual baptism into the body of Christ where two become one. That can't be undone. What God joins together, no man can put asunder. We can't divide that, and therefore we can't lose that. We can't lose that eternal life. We can't lose salvation. In John 10, 28 through 30, it says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Obviously, this is Jesus speaking. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. In John 6, 38 through 40, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Again, Jesus speaking. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So again, it's this union of two into one, and it works both ways. Just like the Father is in the Son and the Son in the Father, we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ, and we become part of that union also, where we are in Christ, but also... We're indwelled by Christ through the gift of the Holy Ghost, which indwells all believers. In John 17, 20 through 23, it points this out very well, where Jesus is speaking to the Father and says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me, love them as thou hast loved me. So, again, God's done all the work for us. And he's such an incredible Heavenly Father. And even though we fail and come short all the time, he has such long-suffering and patience and grace and mercy and love for us. And this is found in Jesus Christ. And it's a free gift that we receive through faith and not of our works, not anything that we do. Um, you know, again, it's what he did and we receive this through faith. And once we do, then that spiritual union occurs. You know, we're able to divorce our flesh. Our flesh is dead and our spirit is able to marry uh, an eternal spiritual body in Jesus Christ who's already overcame death for us. We know that. We have evidence of that. That's the evidence of our salvation is his resurrection. Um, you know, his promise is eternal life and he never breaks his promise. We can rest assured and go out and confidently tell others this good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want to close with Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.